We'll go home now. It's good. It's 401. I'll call the uh, July meeting of the uh, Howard Golf Committee to order. Okay. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements uh, uh, as per the agenda. I stopped into Anita Doucette's office and I set the uh, wheels in motion as far as uh, uh, filling the committee vacancies and uh, also talked to uh, Sandy Robinson and uh, I, I suppose the word is going to get out uh, as far as that's concerned. Uh, and I also, in, in Sandy's office, I archived the existing information on hand regarding people that might be interested in the committee. A couple of people, unfortunately, have passed away. Mm. Consequently, they're not available. <laughs> uh, and, Pardon, excuse. <laughs> and also, the liaison uh, information from the selectman's office hasn't been updated, so it's a process. I'll leave it at that. Uh, you mean you don't have one yet? Exactly. I think I understand the rules. Uh, Who's on the interview committee for the interview? I believe that Mr. McCaskill and Mr. Don Howell uh, okay. are oh, taking, are you involved in that as well? Taking on that responsibility. Uh, no, not in a direct capacity. Uh, you basically, they outside. told basically they told no. me that those mm -hmm. information, uh, the meetings are public meetings. Anyone can attend, but I'm not aware of any meeting being scheduled per se. And as far as the open meeting law is concerned, I imagine they would have to post that. So we have no, yeah, no, 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 I really appreciate his work. Uh, so I'd entertain a motion to accept and approve. So moved. Okay. Second. Second. Uh, by Martha. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, and I appreciate very much the fact that uh, Sean's made himself available here for uh, the director's report. Uh, Roman has that conflict with uh, it's junior golf, right? Yes. Uh, so. Uh, Sorry, my prowess as a power PowerPoint. PowerPoint presenter. Oh, uh, the right arrow. All right. Oh, there you go. Right here. He said the right arrow. Oh, the right arrow. Okay. <laughs> I just listened to what the guy Woo! behind the corner said. <laughs> Thank you, Caleb. Okay. Uh, as far as the director's report's concerned, uh, Roman had, had some extraordinarily uh, good news to share. And it uh, uh, focuses on membership comparison uh, that he did based on uh, Pam's work and, and nuts and bolts. John, it's in your wheelhouse. So basically, um, we've, the membership is up, and it's up drastically. Um, from what I'm understanding, somewhere around 98%. Um, so that means we're- 9%. No, 9%. 9%. Excuse me, 9%. We knew it. 98. That'd be really good. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I, I don't know if we could fit more people on there than there are right up <laughs> at the present time because it's been busy. Um, but yeah, membership is up, so which is good. Um, to the extent where um, Roman has said that uh, starting uh, as we look forward going forward, we'll start looking at the uh, T sheet just to make sure that we can accommodate all the members that we have. So as far as what we've done <coughs> in the past, he said that uh, we had done a, uh, during the week of like a 60-40 split. He said as he goes forward, he will look at that again <coughs> as we go forward to make sure that we're taking care of our members the way we need to take care of the members. In um, essence, he's going to increase uh, the amount of available tea times mm -hmm. for the membership. Correct. Now, something is a plus. also has to be done, Sean, in regard to um, that 6 o'clock policy. I think that we, if we have a policy, we need to stick with it. That if non-member times are released at six o'clock, then people, members are able to get on and be able to make a tea time for the next morning. 
the next day, and that's not happening. Okay. Either they're being released early, before six, and people are going up there and getting tea times, not through the proper process. And that happened when Dennis was here, and it caused a lot of problems. I'd be shocked if that's happening now. Okay. The only reason I tell you that is that pub shop does not do anything as far as giving out tea times in the morning, and they release I'm them the I'm not saying the morning. I'm saying night the night time. before. Previous night. Right, he d but they don't release them until the pro shop's closed. I don't think you can say that, Sean, until you talk to Roman about it. Well, I'm, I'm almost positive because okay. I know there's only four people that can release those, can really open the tea sheet. Well, I know it's <coughs> happening, so please look into it. Sure. Any other comments? I wonder what she told her about the situation is. She, Pam's working on that as we time. Yeah. The, the hottest question we have is she's working, it's trying to do two, two things at the same time, trying to close the books out from 2018 in the towns. We, we just finished doing the town stuff. Now she's trying to catch up and find out what we made in on our end to make sure it matches with what the town has. And that's, again, a conversation that takes a little bit of time between the town so and us. So we probably broke a record this year. I, I'm not going to say we hadn't, but I would assume so. If the, if the membership if the membership was up, happening. and we, you know, even though we had a light spring, we didn't lose any time this spring mm -hmm. as far as rainouts. We went pretty much with what we had, and then also too last fall, thinking that we were going to have, we anticipated because the spring before was so wet, we opened up and it didn't airify until late <coughs> in the season. <coughs> so we opened up the tea sheet, and we allowed to make more money in the fall. So with that and the fact that membership's up, I think we should we're probably going to be on the on the high side. Um, a, couple, a couple of things. The first is uh, when when we brought Chatham in, we didn't bring it in. The selectmen brought it in. But the fact is that uh, it's been building. It's 152. 164. 64. Yeah, maybe we should uh, reinstitute some discussions with the golf committee down there because essentially what we've done is um, allow the people who pay taxes in Chatham not to improve their own golf course, and the people then came up here because of the largesse of the selectmen. I think we should reopen that. Second, and maybe they even give us clam licenses for our guys to look. The second is the Emerson College case. I don't know if you remember that. It yeah. Essentially, this was a case where the fire department in, in, Mass in uh, Boston had been charging for fire protection services to Emerson College. And what they found out was that the monies that they were charging were far in excess of the services provided. And so the, uh, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts said that the extra money is essentially a tax. And it, it, we brought this up some years ago uh, with uh, the financial people here and never really got an answer. But now we're up, what is it? Uh, we've gone for about $190,000 more. A and the question is, uh, you know, we're trying to struggle to pay our portion of the cart buy, et cetera. It would be interesting for the golf committee to understand what, what was the money, the excess revenue beyond expenses uh, for producing the 50,000 rounds of golf. And I, you know, do you follow what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah, I think we should ask the question. I mean, it was like five years ago or six years ago when we went through this struggle. Yeah. And at that time we were charged, when you and I took over, we charged $130,000 one time for a transfer fee and never got explained. Then for five years, we had $80,000 from our revenue that went in lieu of taxes. So it's about a half a million dollars gone. It was almost Meantime, like indirect cost. Pardon me? It was classified as indirect, indirect cost. Yeah, exactly. And we never, we in never other words, it was. It but we was, don't see that anymore. And we was, uh, right, well, we don't see that anymore, but we don't see anything anymore. <laughs> I mean, we used to get an annual budget, or an, I'm sorry, an ex a uh, profit and loss from the golf course. So I haven't seen one for three or four years. Um, and I, I'm, I, I'm not complaining as much as saying th this is extraordinary. We're up $80,000. $80, and <coughs> so what's the financial benefit to the town here? And does it violate the Emerson College case? And should the money be put back into the golf course in excess of what it cost? Just a, just a thought. For the record. Uh, Pete. Um, I've brought this up many times. We, the taxpayers in Howard, Paying more than the 775 or whatever it is that Chatham is paying because we're paying for the uh, renovations to the golf club, the pro shop.
off with paying for the renovation of the of the sand traps and the maintenance building. That's what's going to tax this. And the people in Chatham never see those. Well, as we go forward, uh, well, it's just, you know, it's just I think we should ask if you if you agree, we should ask the town for a uh, a recapitulation of based on this for this year. It looks like uh, the membership is up substantially, and and substantially from Chatham, right. and we'd like to revisit this whole thing from a professional perspective to see if there's some benefit that should accrue for the town. That's all, and to the golf committee because we're taking a portion of the new card barn out of our own revenues, which Roman and you guys have put together that seem to be working. It's a, it's a percentage. The percentage could be more, or we could pay it off faster. Yeah. You know, so exactly. And Tom, a point that you raised before regarding the Chatham members, uh, not just the dollar amount up front, th that's easy to understand, but there's also a collateral effect of their participation as members in a positive way. Oh, I'm not saying it's negative. Yeah. No, no, I'm just looking at the money. No, I know. And also that, that the fact is that someone did an economic analysis of what it, and I've, I've kind of read about this with their golf course down there, mm -hmm. and they're kind of all relieved that we don't have to spend a lot of money because you know, people can come up here and play great rounds of golf. But there should be some kind of a goodwill effect of that, that's all. Okay. Thank you. I wonder if you need a motion, but. Uh. You know, I think I'll uh, uh, take that up personally with Roman because I think, you know, as we move forward, especially into the next month, uh, it's, it's usually incumbent to, to create some kind of financial review for the sake of transparency, especially when we get into the month following everybody, we're get, getting into rates and fees and approval of rates and fees. Well, I think to Tom's point, that always came up at the end of the fiscal year. Yeah, and at the just end of the fiscal yeah. year, yeah. Just we used to get a report, yeah. a yeah. minutes report, which right. even, yeah. even detailed down to the exactly nets. How much we spent on legal fees, oh, no, how much we were assessed on legal fees. There, yeah, that was in the indirect cost, yeah. 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 I'm gonna share something with you that pretty much has been, we will be a cost center. The town sees us as a cost center. Mm. This is what they choose to dictate to us. And basically what we take in and what we dole out is dictated by the selectmen, but they will not make us an enterprise fund. We will stay in a cost center. This is the way they see it. <coughs> the way they can do that is as long as they can balance the book and it looks like what we take in, we spend, is totally legal by the state of Massachusetts. Now the Department of Revenue, just hear me out. Department no question, and they're doing things legally, I'm sure. But Correct. we're also a profit center. I know we don't talk about that in the public sector. Correct. But we're generating funds in excess of uh, the cost to provide the revenue. And that's why the Emerson College case was so important. And so I think we should ask, how does the Emerson College, if, if that's the position they want to take, we should say, well, have, let's have the lawyers look at the Emerson College case and help us understand, because we get questions from our members about this. Correct. The, the, the question, and it comes right down to it is this is the way the selectmen choose to run in this town and this question. and don't get me wrong we've argued that tree up and down numerous times and i've been here for a long time that's fine though but i mean at the end of the day we look upon ourselves as a business i agree right. and right. we look at it as a pnl statement Correct. Yeah. and i think every year we generate at least 300 350 <coughs> give back to the town in terms of profit at least at least. Close to 385 maybe. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I think that information is very important to us to have any leverage to what you're saying in I terms agree. of getting more benefits from the town. See, Munis doesn't have the word profit anywhere in it. No, they don't. But it has an right. excess re uh, uh, revenues. Yeah. yeah, correct. Revenues beyond cost to provide. Correct. Yeah. And that's what Emerson College case was all about. And it's, it's the law. Yeah. Well, well I mean, once we get the Munis report though, it's very easy for us to figure out how much money we're returning to the town in terms of profit. Yes, until until we ask about the indirect costs, because many of them, we don't use any of the services. And in fairness, that's the, that's the town, and I understand yeah. how that works. But we ought to be uh, very knowledgeable about the answers when people ask us about this. Yeah. Right, so. and, and to that point, not only do we look at it as a business, but others do as well. 
It's like, I, how many times do I get asked that question? Yeah, see, that's how much money yeah. we generate, okay, and how much is it, right. you know, how much profit are we right. generating, whether it's, yeah. whether, whether within the context of the town of Harwich, it's defined differently, people's perception is somewhat different than that, and I get asked those, those, uh, those exact questions as well. It's a lot the better. Other, the, other, the other point I'd like to make, okay, with regarding what, what, what Peter just said before, was that I agree from a tax standpoint that we, that some of our taxes go toward paying uh, for upgrades like 50,000 and so on and so forth for, for Cranberry Valley. However, my understanding to this point, okay, still is that this capital improvement project is going to be paid for from fees that are generated by not the taxpayers but by the users of Cranberry Valley that's Golf correct. Course. So Absolutely. that does not come out of our tax bill. So yeah, the only <coughs> thing that's he's, what Mr. Wall was talking about prior to that agreement with the town in which we used and we started putting money aside, the town did business differently. And the, town, the way the town did was raise an appropriate through your taxes to do the project. So in 01, when we built the brand new building and when we did the maintenance facility in 05 and again in 07, we borrowed loans in which the town backed us 100% and we borrowed money. That money was then turned around and it's continued to be paid by both the taxpayers and the golf course. Yeah. So mm -hmm. understand that mm -hmm. what Mr. Wall says, that is true. That, that was after we got through 09, the way that we raised and appropriated money to do work at Cranberry Valley changed. Yeah. And it's no longer done that way. The only way that we can get work done is we have to prove that we can have the money and that we can fund it ourselves. And that way we are now self-sufficient. Fair enough. And, and the incredible thing is, as you're, as you're well aware of, Pete, 2020 is suddenly coming up pretty fast. And at, in 2020, it's all gone. that encumbered debt is retired completely. Thank you. So, uh, in any event, I, you know, Michael. Excuse, excuse yeah. my English, but we got blank for X number of years. Well, understand, <laughs> understand this, and it's a, and I always say this: it's above our pay grade because there were the negotiations that were happening outside of this room that coincided with something else that's going on in Chatham, in which we're going to be pumping sewage, and they use that as a tool and use us as a tool to try to negotiate that. Good, bad, or indifferent, yeah. it's above our pay grade. We didn't have that access. But, so. I, but I think, Tom, too, that uh, another avenue that should be pursued is this. We know how the committee dealt with the issue. And we know that the selectmen decided to take a direction that satisfied them. And my point is, I think if, if, if they're responsive to public sentiment that, you know, there's a perception of not being fair or equitable, they should pursue that. Uh, they have taken no, no initiative, to my knowledge, to actually, you know, accrue some benefits that would come our way in this relationship. Well, yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, we're, we're representing, you know, the taxpayer, the people, and the golfers. The fact is that the revenues are substantially up and we'd like to know how it's being handled. You know, very simple. Yeah. And secondly, you know, does the Emerson College case apply because it's, we seem to be producing income far in excess of what it costs for us to provide the service. Okay. It's now, very simple. I, I agree with you 100%. I have no problem with that. But understand, when you open that can, of, uh, that can, it goes across the town because they're going to do the same in harbor, they're going to do the same in water, they're going to do the same in highway, yep. they're going to do the same in ambulance funds. So understand, the reason our taxes are where they are is because this town has taken a stance in 1970, which is we are a cost center. We have costs. We pay for those costs with, these, with this amount of money, which is one pool. All of it goes into a pool. We do, at town meeting, we dole it out as we see fit. That's the way that this town's been run since 1970. It continues. Now, is it agreeable that that's the way to do business? No. I would say in my world, and I've always said this, you have wants and needs. The wants got to be taken, the needs need to be taken care of, the wants you pay for. And guess what? They don't see it that way. If you had that the case, your taxes would be paying for the needs, which are ambulance, highway, police, fire, the things that need to be taken care of, and the wants you would pay for. But the problem is, this is a cost center. This town sees it as a cost center. These are the services it's provided to the residents of this town and the people that choose to come to visit it, and they choose it to run it that way. They've done it since 1970, and they continue to run it the same manner. The problem that you have is you have to bring it to the people that make those decisions, and no longer can it be a cost center and that it needs to be run as a business. Yeah. But the problem is, again, like I said, above our pay grade. 
Yeah, but, uh, but they, there, are, there are checks and balances with it. And the SJC said that when a municipality does this, it's illegal. Not illegal, but it's a tax. And therefore, it has to go through all of the stuff that you go through to approve a tax. Correct. So The only issue that you face, which is hard to fight, is when you go to DOJ, yeah. the, and, the, and what I mean by that is the Department of Revenue, and they come out and say that, and there's been issues in other towns that have had been set up the same way, they've turned around and said the town can do it. And well, the reason, and, and the yeah. only reason they say yeah. that is, yeah. right. is because they can, and municipal allows them to move money right. at the last minute and they can show a deficit or show an inc increase right. and that hurts your argument of that well, situation. Well, but I don't, you know, if it does fine and, we're, and they say to us, sorry guys, we understand, Correct. we've looked at it all and it's a dead issue, it's a dead issue. But you want to just think I totally agree. We should raise it as a response. I totally agree. I don't have a problem. Trying to do the right thing, that's all. I've been asking that question for the better part no, of 20 years. No, no, I understand. <laughs> I understand. So. Okay, that's, I mean, I would, don't you want, I mean, if you want, I, I, if you okay. need a motion, that's just. Uh, uh, well, I think, uh, you know, looking forward to the August meeting that uh, with, with Pam doing what she is doing, uh, if it's appropriate, the room is comfortable, we can get some kind of analysis of a year end review, John. We just need the Munich report. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's that simple. Well, usually but it takes four months after the fiscal year closes to get that. Well, the issue you're going to face is this. We just closed. It hasn't officially even closed yet. We haven't paid last bills. They'll be out. We have last warrant going out uh, this week. Yeah. So once you get last wa warrant, she's really not going to say anything as far until she gets certified free cash, which probably won't happen until sometime in the middle of August before she cer certifies okay. everything. Whatever it happens, so, that's fine. But what you can get is a... Uh, a, a breakdown from Eunice of roughly where we stand. There might be some final adjustments that need to be made, but you'll have a yeah. good idea. Yeah. You'll have an idea of what was taken in for how much. Now, what total costs are and what was all uh, marked off, you may not get total, but you'll get total revenue. But these numbers will be on uh, this fiscal year that just closed. Yes, we closed books, and the, all the but membership was taken in fine. before. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is what stimulated the conversation. Correct. So, yeah, that's fine. Correct. That's fine. Demo day. Yep. Okay, demo day. Yeah, today we had uh, Callaway was in there on the drive range feed doing a demo. We've had a couple, we had another demo day. Titles was in there probably about a month ago. Um, we're getting a lot of traffic, um, and it's nice to see, you know, at, th at this point because it brings in a lot of business. Um, the nicest thing is is that, you know, we're not out of pocket, as whereas we were clubs and stuff before, so it's in the, in the grand scheme, it's great for them because they're doing business on the D. People see them, they generate their own business, and then they can, if they want to order something, they come in and they order it from us. Have so it works out good. Uh, having been up there today, swing a few clubs, okay, I also see there's a secondary benefit to Rob Miller, okay, if he's selling that. He's selling Correct. Business. John. Nothing wrong, with, nothing wrong with that. No. To that point, uh, Mr. Miller happens to be in the picture here. Correct. And it made me think of this. Uh, I went up today just to uh, hit a few balls. I didn't realize Calvary was going to be there, but the point is, uh, Bob engaged me, and uh, he and Roman have been in discussion. He's very positive about what's gone on with Miller Golf, its association with Cranberry Valley, and uh, they will be going into negotiation as well on that contract. And uh, uh, he said informally that he was very much in favor of uh, asking for trying to broker a five-year agreement as opposed to just the two years, I think, that are left on this existing agreement. So it's all very positive, and uh, in a nutshell, the fact that we have, if you think about this, Tom, compared to ancient history, we've got five active pros that are giving lessons, I don't want to say around the clock, but pretty much, they are very busy, and uh, thank God we have the system in place that we have, because otherwise, we'd have the person who's being paid to be manager and director of right. golf out on the lost on the lesson tee. <coughs> well, it's two yes. things. One is we need to have Roman uh, tell us what the value added has been over the old system and right. then what the potential for added value is for an extended contract. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's very rare. And they'll come to us and we'll make something. Well, you know, and, and I'll tell you this, just the, the added traffic of people yeah. at the course between the junior program and the lessons and everything else yeah. has really, I mean, I, I know everyone's driving the streets of Cape Cod, especially after the 4th and how busy it was, but if you come up to Cranberry Valley, it is, I mean, we got, I mean, with the project going, even if that project wasn't going, the parking lot would be to the end of the parking lot. 
no question. No I, doubt. I, excuse me. Yeah, no, go ahead. I just dropped off my grand, uh, my grand uh, nephew up there. He's in that PGA group. And in the, yes. He's also in the, in the other team. Yeah. And there's about 15 kids up there. They're all, and the, the driving range is packed with people. Right. Yep. It's absolutely, you're absolutely right. The traffic has increased. In, it, it it's increased. And which only it bodes well for Cranberry Valley. It's it's showing you the the, the true potential yeah. of where we're going to end up within the next five years once all this construction is done yeah. and what the icing on the cake when you come up there and the full benefit of what Cranberry Valley will have. Oh, I agree. And one, that's a one good point. segue. <laughs> one point though, I had a conversation with Roman about the week of July fourth, and uh, we talked about how how compacted everything was and there was just so many rounds being sold. Yeah. But he talked about the stresses that the, that the, uh, the help has been undergoing trying to deal with that, especially people in the pro shop. Mm. I mean, I saw personally a foursome coming in and said, well, we're ready to go in the tea time. We don't have a, you don't have a, you know, can we go out now? Yeah. July 4th. I know. Yeah. You know, and so, <laughs> oh yeah. So, so Romans had to go back and work overtime with the staff just, you know, Try to things will down. be okay. Okay. Things will be okay. And you know, that ha th I mean, on both staffs, this happens a lot of the times when the 4th of July falls on a, on the yeah. middle of the week. Yeah. Because everyone comes down and spends a whole week. So what ends up doing is, is they got to find something to do and if, and they're going to be playing golf and they're going to be at the beaches. And for us, yeah. it was, I mean, we didn't have any league play. I guarantee you everyone in that place was <coughs> hoping for ladies and men to show back up because it was norm normalcy is what we know that week. You know, the thing that was very concerning about the July 4th week was that there was the junior league was not canceled, but all the upper league were on July 4th, and the members really noticed that. Well, I think more so than, than anything, the reason that the leagues were canceled was more of the morning time and make it a little bit more normalcy as far as just tea times, whereas in the afternoons, it tends to slow down. Yeah, but I, I, honestly, I could not get a tea time all week. I was on some new term, over. Yeah, overbooked. Over, over I don't know what it's called, but I don't know what it even meant. But every single time I tried to apply for a tea time mm -hmm. a week ahead, I couldn't get it. And yet we had the juniors take up all afternoon. Well, you know, the, the thing is, is I think when you guys sit down and you decide that you wanted to, and when we do our uh, book your stuff in the fall for tournaments and stuff, and it's something you can sit down and have a conversation with Roman, but you guys as a committee made a pledge to the juniors program and this will dictate to us what will be the next 20 years. Now, I, I understand that where we're at, but again, it's something you have to bring up with Roman at that time, and if you guys choose to make a different situation, then it's up to you guys. Well, I've got the schedule here for, uh, I think today there was a tournament, and, the, and I, I think maybe the fourth, it was the fourth, it was only one day in July, I think it was today. Is it just maybe the demand for that? Well, day? understand, like I said to you before, there's a lot more people on the Cape, and, yeah. and, and that, that week is always going to be busy, no yeah. matter what. Right. And you've got a lot of members that take a lot of time off that time of year that want to come play Cranberry Valley. Right. So, you know what I mean? So it's going to be busy. It's always been busy for July. It's always 6 to 6, no matter how we look at it. 6 in the morning to 6 at night. Yeah. 350 people are going to come to that golf course. That's the worst week of the year. It is. Yeah. For private or public. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Yeah. It's the worst week. <laughs> right. You want to touch on this, John? Oh, oh, yes. Oh. Yeah. There you go. Yes, this is the junior program. It's going extremely well, um, from what I'm understanding from Roman. Um, everything, it, both at both at uh, Howitchport and at our golf course, the program is working unbelievable compared to um, to what we've had in the past. I mean, our, don't get me wrong, our junior program was good but this is really putting icing on the cake. Um, the kids love it and the, and the rest of the town loves it and this is what's gonna set us up for the next 40 years at Cranberry Valley right here. And speaking of uh, not just the junior league, but the drive, chip, and putt. Yeah, we had a, that was a nationally drive, <coughs> chip, and putt, which is what you saw last week during 4th July. But that was the week that, we yeah. did that, that they did that. That was a nationally uh, thing. That, and I think the reason they did that was because the kids were on vacation. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought that was the week before. I'm, I, Oh, maybe it was. It was. Maybe it, it was, was the week that we had it. It was the rainy day. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. The miracle was that they actually got it off. I, well, 
Yeah. I was shocked that they played him. In. I mean, <coughs> don't get me wrong. I don't think they had the turnout that they thought they were going to have because of the weather. Mm. Yeah. But I mean, you can see golf. I mean, the, the junior program. And I have nothing against oh. juniors. Oh no, I okay. don't. No, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't assume that. It's you like to play golf and you want to play golf when you want to get out. I mean, there's no no doubt that every member <coughs> of Cranberry Valley feels the same way. Doesn't matter who's out there. They everyone wants to play golf. I, I told everyone. I said. You know, when we built Cranberry Valley in 1973, I didn't think they'd think that it was going to be this unbelievable of a golf course. And then, yeah. and I told everyone when I came in 20 years ago that I said, you know, we're going to turn it around and it's going to be one of those, a gem of the town again. And one of my guys said, well, we need to go back a little bit just so that we can get tea time to not make it so <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, I've heard that. Yeah. And I said, well, I said that the one thing that we know is that we do well is maintain the golf course. And I said, the, the thing is, when people know they have a value in what they see when they come, it's hard to tell them not to come. And that's the, that's the issue that we face at Cranberry Valley. Yeah. See, this was a good segue into the superintendent's, into the superintendent's report. report. Can I ask, for, uh, on the junior, is there a plan to kind of highlight some of the kids who did something good so that, and put it on the web page as, so at the end of the season, and then it brings them back for next year. Or next I year. believe so. I think Roman. I think she's got. He's got Haley. Haley. We have a young lady that works at the works at the golf course. She's been um, and you know, some of the stuff I'll talk about. She's already a certificate or something. For certain oh yeah, they do that. They hand out all that to the kids and everything else. And then I'm pretty sure you'll see something on the web page. Yeah. Um, the more that we go forward, the more that you'll see stuff on the, on the website and yeah. stuff that we've been doing and and how we go about it. It's it's nice that we have Haley because Haley's you know a typical you know 20 year old that lives on her phone, so it makes life easier. When you can just say, go post all that stuff, <laughs> it makes it easier for us, you know? So we had a kid who, on the Monomoy team this year who was 15th in the state mm -hmm. because of the amateur. And she got a, a free ride, I think, at Florida Atlantic University. Yes. And she's going to play golf that year. So, I mean, it means something to the kids, you know? Oh, without a doubt. Good benefit, yeah. So, superintendent's report. Um, so. As you all know, and Roman had re reported to you, we came out of the, the winter time and gone into summer, and we were right into the mix of stuff. We've had some uh, some issues coming out of the season. We um, had a delay in the pump house. Um, basically, we put a new engine in the pump house, as you all know by what we spent. We put three new brand new pumps in, in there and did a new controller. The parts got back ordered, so it took a little longer to get it in. So basically, by the time we got it in and got it up and running, we ran into what we usually see is you, you have your, your problems that you're going to face. And those problems, we're trying to get it to maintain pressure and hold overnight. There was some subtle adjustments we made, and it took a while. But also, too, we found out some other issues. One of the other issues that we fought, and then what you're seeing out there now, is during the winter time, because we had no pump house in there, we thought everything was fine. But during the um, four, was it four or five nor'easters, in which they kept shutting power on and turning it off, it basically sent surges through the system. And when it did, it actually whacked a couple, and I think we had um, some issues on the, well, we did have issues on the golf course, but we might have even taken a strike at one time, lightning or something th that came through, because we found n uh, some numerous solenoids that were whacked. And what I mean by a solenoid is each head has its own little power cord on it, and basically we charge that to run the system. Well, when you go out there and you start, and we didn't find this out until late in June, early July, because Mother Nature supplied tons of rain for us, so we didn't see those gaps in that system. Well, when we go to turn the system on, I couldn't get it to run all night because I have two, inside my pump house I have a controller, but also on my wall I have three uh, boxes that talk to every head on the f out on the field. Mm -hmm. Well, two of the boxes wouldn't hold the charge. Oh, so we didn't find that out until we started running the system. And then we started going, well, why isn't this, what's this? So then I changed that out. Wait, this one's doing it too. So we changed those both out. We got that running. And then once we did that, we could start going out into the field and see where our gaps were and see what the problems were. And that's what we've been fixing since then. Since then, pump house is holding pressure. Everything's good. Um, we do have one issue. We changed out only three of the pumps. The jockey that we didn't change out <coughs> needs to be changed out. It basically was the one pump that was working early. It took most of the brunt of everything not running in the early in the spring, so now we have to change that out. The good thing is, is that I have the money in the budget to do it, so we're going to use the money within the budget so we don't have to approach the town. Right. I have money in there that I would have normally bought a piece of equipment. Well, this is a piece what, of equipment. What cost was? About $17,000. Wow. 
I now understand the jockey is, uh, if you looked at my pump house, I pumped 1,500 gallons. The three big pumps were our 40 horse, the jockey is a 30 horse. Yeah. So that allows us. Now, can I run without it? I am running as a present time without it. Do we want to not put it in there? M we want to make sure we have a jockey. What the jockey basically does is. Keeps the pressure. Keeps the pressure, but it's also what we call the main pump that fills in the gap. So when I'm watering, let's say I'm watering during the day, instead of turning on one of my big pumps, it turns on the jockey. Let's say I'm washing down equipment in the back, yep. that jockey turns on. It saves the main, your main pumps so you don't have to use it. That's what the purpose of the jockey is. The first pump that turns on, the last pump that turns off is the jockey. So what we, when I talked to my gentleman, uh, the pump guy, we had a conversation and the conversation was, you know, at 13 years old, we got 13 right. years out of the pump. In 2005, we changed this jockey out. Yeah. 13 years on a jockey that runs basically on, 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 it's like turning it on and off, on and off all day. It's actually pretty, we've done pretty well with it. So at this point, once we change the jockey out, there's nothing left in the pump house th as far as pumps that needs to be changed. John, excuse me, but uh, what's going forward mm -hmm. in the next level of technology as far as heads are concerned, uh, the reliance on hard wiring through the system? Correct. Are we going to be able to uh, move around that with uh, wireless technology? Yeah, well, the biggest thing you don't want to do is you don't want to jump down that rabbit hole all too fast. Right. It's changing so fast right now that we don't want to be the forefront of that te technology. So what I've always done is I've always looked at it and, and done what we're going to do right now is we're going to change some stuff out. And coming forward, what, I wrote, what we had proposed to you is to go from a two-wire path to a single-wire path. And, that, and what that does is gives us a little bit less wire in the ground to have to rely on when we have these problems that happened over the wintertime. So th by doing that, eventually you'll be able to get to the point where you have a head that sits here and all there is is water, no wire. And basically I'm talking from a box that's across the fairway that talks to that wirelessly. Yeah. That's eventually where we're going to end up. But right and enhance your ability to know that you, which heads on, on, on the well, 18th hole are, are Correct, right. because what's going to happen is when I get that control right now, yeah. all I have is basically a pager in the ground that sends a wire and charges the solenoid and charges it back. All it tells me is, in this box, I can know on my computer that I can send the power to it and that it sent the power. I don't know if it came on or not. Now. Until I vi now. now. Until I visually go out and check on it. But in the future, by talking back and forth wirelessly, I'll be able to get communication <coughs> back and forth between it to know if it ran, how long it ran, and if it's running in the most efficient manner. That's how much technology is changing. If that, if that head is defective now, correct. Okay, let's say it like, like the first hole it blew out. Correct. Okay, does that mean you're pumping water into the air? Correct. Okay. So until we go around, and this, is, and this is the issue that we faced in the middle of June when we had to start to turn the system on, the only way was I was coming back early in the morning, we'd run all morning, check everything, run around, making sure everything runs, leave, come back in the evening and work from four until dark and do the exact same thing because there's no one around. Yeah. I can't turn on water during the middle of the day at eight minute tea times. Right, right. So that's the only way for the better part of basically the middle of the end of May to the end of June, we were running basically back and forth in the evening to try to keep it, al basically what we did was keep it alive. Basically keep greens, teas and fairways alive. What took it on the chin was mostly rust. Okay. And that's what you're supposed to do. You do exactly what you need to do to make sure that you keep your green teas in line. Now, US, that leads us right into the USGA. I know that Mr. Wheeler was there and Mr. Wall was there. It, again, he came in. It was great. I think that the meeting was great. I think he gave us some good, some good um, solid ar uh, ergonomics that we should be following, which we have been following. We need to do more of, yeah. which is what we're going to incorporate into the program. Um, the things that we're doing is he thinks that we have some of the best, I mean, it's the end of, it's July, last week was July 12th. He, we had four and a half inch roots on our greens in July 12th, which means that's unbelievable for the middle of July. Yeah. Usually you, you're looking at an inch and a half to two inches. He's very impressed with the, with the amount of grass that we have on our greens. Same thing with fairways, to the point where he said he thought we had some of the best fairways around, yeah. um, and particularly for rye grass. Again, four and a half inch roots. What he'd like to see us do is increase the amount of top dressing, and again, this starts to play into a, a little bit, me and Roman have talked, and Roman brought up in the meeting, a little bit of a, of we may need to manipulate the tea sheet a little bit to allow us to get out and do these things. Because we're at a point now where at six o'clock tea times off both nines, the window is very tight for us. So if there's a one little small hiccup or something happens, 
it doesn't allow us to complete the jobs that we're trying to complete. Right. As much as we want that all $90 to come in the door and make the money we're making, we also have to find a fine way to get the, the work that we need to done on the golf course to give the conditions that we, you guys have been used to and continue to want. So, I so see, uh, just a question. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the upgrade to the um, system that's going to be wireless, do you do we have money in a budget somewhere or we're going to plan to put it in the money? Oh, we have it on. It's have yeah. adequate Tom, funds for that. Uh, yeah. I, I met this week actually with Roman because uh, I knew that the questions were going to be asked regarding, uh, you know, capital's capital outlays perspective on what we're doing. Yeah. And I want to present that entirety to the committee. Thank so uh, Sean's come up with a, with a scheme to uh, implement that over a number of years. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be cost effective at the same time, but there will be costs associated with it, certainly. And uh, it's so we've got an extra just exciting. It's, a, yeah, it's exciting <laughs> yeah. stuff. Well, we, see, that's why we need to plan this stuff and cost it and say, you know, next year's budget, we need this. Yeah. You know, uh, we don't have reserve accounts here, but we need a reserve account. You know, we do have those three accounts that we could fund yeah. based on this. So we have to be clever and strategic about this. And understand, you know, the, the nicest thing is, is that, you know, I'll be honest with you, I've talked to a lot of my, my peers and everyone, and they ask questions like, what, how can we do, how do we do what we're doing at Cranberry Valley? How have you been able to do what you've been able to do? And it's been a, a, a basically, a sit down conversation with the, with you guys and say okay this is how we're going to go about it this is and we came up with the plan and i told them the, the willingness of the town and the the golf committee to come up with the plan and stick to the plan has allowed us to do the things that we're doing i said there's a lot of golf courses out there that ha don't have the luxury that we've had they still owe on their land they still owe a lot of debt you see the newspapers you've seen what's happened in yarmouth you've seen what's happened in brewster yeah the, and understand and the, south yana yeah three hundred thousand dollar assessment <laughs> so understand exactly the, those things aren't going to show up at your door because of the, what we've been planning for the last 20 years and the good thing is is that I mean it's a lot of work because we go out of construction back into the golf season back into construction but this is a necessary evil to continue the process that we're doing and maintaining what we have and this is the issue that the town never did before and that now at least you, they're willing to do it now is maintain what you have Okay. By the way, John deserves a lot of credit on that because of the strategic plan. You kind of honchoed that for us. Well, I think it's all of us for the fund. Well, I understand. If we have the fund, we wouldn't be able to yeah. do any of this stuff. Yeah, be <laughs> humble. Yeah. Huh? Just take credit. No. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? If we didn't have the government well, no, improvement plan, yeah. none of this stuff would have even started. No. Oh. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. In 2000, and when I got here in 1999, I remember in 2004 when we lost employees, and I went to the town administrator and I said, listen, I said, I didn't come here to, to sit on my fingers. Yeah. I said, we, we came here to do a job. So either we got to start putting some stuff aside and start making some com real commitment to Cranberry Valley or we're not going to get anywhere. Right. And since then, we've, we've, I mean, it, here it is 14, yeah. 14 years later, and the amount of work that we've done and we continue to do has made huge strides in what we have. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're at a point, and Jim, the USGA gentleman said this, that you basically have a private club golf course being treated like a public golf course. Yeah. A lot of people at private All the way around. All the way around. We well, of course, being treated, treated like, like a private. private. private yeah. But what I'm saying to you is, a lot of the a lot of private clubs don't get what they get when they come to Cranberry Valley. Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? When you go to a private club, you would only hope that they would do the things that we do, and a lot of private clubs people aren't seeing that. And they pay uh, ten to a hundred times more. More. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. Tom, I got a question here, and I, and I don't know whether I need to hold it, but I'll ask the question, and you can decide. Rate session, okay, with USGA. I could understand half of it, at both, okay, because it is a different different language these guys talk, okay? Mm -hmm. The question becomes is, did we learn anything new from that USGA visit that we didn't already know? <laughs> well, let me put it this way. I would, well. Can I, we, I, uh, excuse me, can we table that, John? That's why I asked the question. Okay, All right, we'll table it. Because we've got it on the agenda. We yeah. can. That's fine, that's fine. Because I wanted your input. That's fine. No, no, and, no. I, and I think it's very constructive. Uh, that doesn't okay. bother me. Uh, so, uh, in any event, under new business, uh, and with the absence of Jeff Williams, and uh, I was glad that Mike's uh, minutes recognized both he and uh, Mr. Kingsbury uh, for their efforts. Uh, once again, to underscore, I reached out to Martha, and uh, Martha is making herself available to uh, 
once again be elected to vice chair as well as myself for chairman. Is there anyone else that is interested in either of those positions? If not, I'd entertain a motion to uh, uh, vote unanimously or vote for uh, both the chair and vice chair as proposed. So moved. Okay, second? Second. Okay, uh, any discussion? All Just David? thank you for thank you for volunteering. Thank you for those kind of thank yous and a lot of work. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Martha, your target is just a little smaller than my target. <laughs> <laughs> a lot smaller. Thank you very much. A lot. Uh, now the USGA meeting, and I'll start yeah, the discussion. The only other question I have is the vacancies. Okay. On uh, the, on the board. The, the, mm -hmm. On the committee. Yes. And uh, I don't know how we do that to, uh, I don't want to say influence, but at least to educate the two guys, the selectmen that are looking for the credentials to really be on this committee. John, John raises a good point. It's a yeah, there, process yeah, there are certain almost. credentials, okay, that these two gentlemen brought to the table okay. that are now void. And my hope is, okay, that the credentials, okay, that were now a void for us, will be filled with individuals with similar credentials. I, 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 can't, I can't tell I, you exactly what they are, but I mean, just. It's always a vetting process. Yeah, 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 it is. yeah exactly. Yeah. And it, you know, as far as the description of a golf committee is concerned, you know, as far as the committee handbook, Sean, it's, it's pretty general, but uh, one thing that we have introduced to it is a business background, administrative background, uh, a desire to be invested in golf, uh, and also the best interest of the town. Uh, other than that, it's, it doesn't have a lot of specificity. I mean, I would love to see, just just a thought to throw out to all of you, I'd love to see a small select group of questions that we could put together to assist them in that vetting process, John, because it, it makes sense. I, I would do that. I could do that for you. I did a job for you know thirty years. I could do that. It's very simple. But I agree. I th I would. I'd make a motion that we tell the uh, interviewing selectmen that we'd like representation um, in case questions about our details come up. We have a million eight from our figures mm -hmm. coming in every year, right. and it's a business. We need someone with some sense of business. We need someone who has a history of relationship with golf and someone who has been in the town and understands the dynamics of the town. You know, very simple kinds of things. I don't know that you develop a rubric that, you know, I could do that, but answer, you know, which question is the one that answers. Yeah, I think there's only really three or four important that. questions. Yeah. That, you what? Know, we want a person that's really interested in how we move Cranberry Valley ahead, raise the bar, not about how we get more tea times or no, no, you're more right. water on the course. Uh, I agree, agree. I agree. You know, we've got people that do that. Yeah. And if we don't, we, we will have people yeah. that do that. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. We, we no, want to no, look no. at the big yeah. picture. Correct. Yeah. I mean, and how we make Cranberry Valley right. a premier municipal golf course this year and 10 years from now. Right. Right. Strategic planning, you know, those things. Uh, I, I think you, you should. I'll, I'll share something have, We'd like you. to put a couple of people on the committee, advisory, I, I observers, think and to answer questions. But, you know, I'll, tr I'll throw questions together you could take a look at them the hard, the hard thing that you face well. is and I'll, I'll, I'll be as, as uh, coy with it as possible is that you are telling the people who who appointed you that you'd like say in how they do their job because maybe they don't do it quite as well and you have to have a little bit of tact in the way you approach <coughs> the people well, that di yeah. diplomatic. Well, the and approach I is this is this is additional input for you to use at your discretion, well, okay? I, I, in terms of the vetting I, process. Well, let me put it this way: I think you'd have better. Uh, you guys are all individual residents of the town of Howard. You know who the two selectmen are. I think that if you approach them in your own manner, and said that, uh, as as a citizen, and as a m member what you would express your concerns as you guys talk about it and what you would like to see here. I think if you shared it in that manner, I think you'd get a lot more done than putting something together and filing it up to their office and saying, hey, this is what we want. Well, you know, that's a good point. Uh, but I do think as a committee, we ought to have a position. 
the problem that you face is, and the, I, I agree with you. But our, our interest is in s saving the town money. On the other hand, we have got to do things that cost the town money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, over the years, we've tried to keep an equilibrium about all that. We need people that have a sense of that, whatever, yeah. you know, a business or whatever. I think the other discussion that we should have, and we should have Roman here for that discussion yeah, as well, right. is what right. is the right number of people on the committee? Right. Do we need seven or do we need five? That's true. <laughs> That's true. Mm -hmm. What makes seven the magic number? In all of the, all the of charter, the town committees. I think the charter seven. was seven. Correct. Yeah, I that could change. Charter was seven. <coughs> yeah, but that could change. That could change. And but, as far as town committees are concerned, in general, uh, and I think Don Howell shed some light on this at one of the selectmen's meetings. There are a lot of problems regarding available people. Yes. And in the shifting pattern of, of winter activity where, you know, residents of the town are, are in Florida or in a remote destination for a, a larger period of the year. And I think, Tom, if you remember <coughs> back, I mean, I spoke to that issue publicly when I have to do my little review there in front of the selectmen. I said, this is just personal, but I think it is totally archaic, the fact that you can't have remote participation and voting w within a committee. Yeah. And, and, and I know their pushback yeah. is, okay. well, that, you know, there's nothing like having that person physically right there. I mean, you can, you can do the, uh, oh, so what, you can do the, the live TV thing right. and have, I mean, how much okay. more do you want? Uh, so I, maybe that's something we could push as well. It, it just would, it would open up because I think there's maybe a quotient of people out there that figure, oh man, I'm in Florida, I, I, I couldn't make that commitment. I mean, we've streamlined our meetings. You're saying this is for every committee in town? I Correct. would say yeah. every committee, yeah. yeah. They, they gotta Chamber wake up policy. because. Chamber, uh, committee town wide policy. Yeah. If, if John, if you saw the list, I just reviewed it. They have a lot of problems. Committee vacancies? Yeah. It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And there's some really, th they're not revenue specific like we are, but they're, I think, very important committees that yeah. they have no one yeah. that's, that's even applied. So uh, yep. maybe I'll bring that sentiment diplomatically to Mr. Howell and, uh, and to Mr. McCaskill and, and get. How many committees know. does Pete Wall on? Can they be on another committee? <laughs> Pete's on capital outlay and yeah. FinCom. FinCom. Yeah, yeah. I think so. They can wear, I guess you can wear you can two wear, hats. You can wear, wear well, yeah. there's only, by, by charter and by bylaw, you, there's certain committees you cannot belong to and have two hats. You can't be on the selectmen and be on FinCom. You can't be on FinCom and be yeah. on yeah. one yeah. other one. But I'm not sure which one. But there's, they have their own rules. Yeah. But you can be on numerous committees if need be. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on to the USGA meeting. Uh, and I'll start with uh, Mr. Wheeler, because I, I think that was a great insight, John. Uh, it was, uh, I enjoy those because it's, it's, an, it's an exploration of Cranberry Valley from another perspective. Yeah. Um, I, and as, again, I understand fi maybe 50% of the lingo you guys are talking back and forth, but I'm picking up bits and pieces, which is good. Yeah. Um, what I find is he tends to reinforce the things that I've heard before. Correct. And uh, there have been some new ones, okay? Um, Sunseeker FBN1, <laughs> um, but I'm not hearing a lot of new stuff. Uh, we didn't discuss the 17th, for example, the, the green okay on the right-hand side. Uh, he brought that up before. What can we do about that? Yeah, we've done. But that. I guess the question becomes: Is what are we learning that's new that well, we don't already know? About you know, to give you the reason that we started with USGA was to make sure when I first came in the door was to make sure that the prior superintendent didn't use the USGA did not come in. And a lot of golf courses don't use the USGA at all. M I think we might be one of the only municipal golf courses that actually hires the USGA on a yearly basis to come in. The purpose of the, of the reason that we used them in the beginning was to show the town that this basically, basically I'm a hired employee for the town. Well, I'm gonna speak what needs to get done, but sometimes it's nice to have an outside firm that you have consult come in and tell you to match up to what I'm saying to make sure that, that those things are getting done. What, so we use that as a tool then and we still to this day use that tool. 
The good thing is, it's 21 years in, we've been using this, the tool has worked, but again, there might be a time when you say, you know what, how much more can you tell us? Because yes, I am doing exactly what we should be doing. And every year you guys see that, both in, in the revenue and the condition of the golf course. Now, you may want to decide at a later date that instead of doing it every year, we do it every other year or every third year so that we can. Well, well we've, we've made that move made to that every other year. year. That's right, so that they can yeah. see that, hey, let us do some of the work that we're doing to make sure. Yeah. Now, at, as I walk out the door and the next person comes in or the person after that, you may, want, you may choose to go back to the USGA and do more of it to make sure that the superintendent's doing what he's supposed to be doing. But it's the only way that you guys can know for sure and you have an outside source to talk that lingo with me to understand that I'm doing the job that I'm supposed to be doing. That's your chance to listen to him and hear what I'm saying back to him and him saying back to me and both in the report and what I say that yes, we are putting down less than four pounds of nitrogen, three pounds on tees, two pounds on this, and that we are doing these things to make sure that the turf quality is, is at its peak, its performance. Okay, two questions. Number one is what does it cost us to have him come? Number two is what additional benefits do we have because we have formed this bond with USGA? For example, those trackers that we have. Correct. Okay. Yep. Was that, you, was that, do, can, can we take a piece of that being invited to a, Participate yes, as you part can. of our relationship with USGA. Yes, you can. And there was only there was only three other golf courses that got yeah. those trackers. And that we was were a kudos one. because, to my knowledge, out of the out of the three, uh, ours was the biggest municipal operation. It was. That was even entertained, and and overall, John, uh, and this is my perspective, because I've been here as long as Tom. Uh, what I loved about this consultation was it took the politics out of a lot of the uh, decision making in a, in a sense, especially with the former director of golf uh, where there was some sensitivity about decisions being made. It allowed the committee to say, look, it's got nothing to do with this individual. You know, let's not get into the world of prejudices. This is what the USGA <coughs> has described. Sean's in step with it. That's why we're continuing with this program. And if there's money involved, uh, it's money well spent. Another thing that's come out of it, just to guys give you an idea, was the perfect example was UMass and the talking about the washdown yep. pad. Yep. He, uh, the ladies, I got to reach out to her. She's already reached out to me, left a message. I got to return the phone call, but again, and put me back in touch with someone over there that might end up putting us in, instead of spending money like everyone else did in, on a washdown pad that works, but isn't the most environmental. We'll put us in touch with UMass, who's running a new program that will then guide us down that in that more of a what we call a holistic idea to to wash down. Pat. In, in I think the other benefit too would be that you gain a different perspective because this guy visits a lot of golf courses, That's so correct. they might be yeah. doing things at right. X course that might help you here at correct. the Sherman <coughs> Valley or he yeah. did talk certain about, situation. He, he talked about those forward tees at Concord and how they were. Yeah, but there might be, let's say, a disease that's going yeah, around on the yeah. Cape Cod perfect. courses. Yeah. Oh, a perfect example is, is when he was talking about Great Leaf Spot. When he first came in, Great Leaf Spot was, well, on our rye we have rye grass fairways. He, he came in and we had Great Leaf Spot running rampant on the back nine fairways. When I first came in, and he, he said, go completely away from Great Leaf Spot because everyone's getting Great Leaf Spot, it's not going to make. So we did. And then he came back five years later, six years later, and says, go back to Great Leaf Spot. We're finding that the, there's a new, a new breed out there that's endophyte resistant, so it doesn't get Great Leaf Spot. And so then we did do that, and now we have the fairways that we have. And none of that would have been knowledge that we would have picked up on our own. It would, other than me yeah. going to an event and yeah. seeing and hearing through other people. But this way, we had a gentleman come to us who's seen it. At, he's been in New Jersey. He's been in all those golf courses. He sees what's there. He sees the latest. It creates a great efficiency. And John, you asked about the cost involved. Oh. It is just such cheap money. It's a couple of thousand bucks. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, which, you know, um, certainly justifies it. Yeah, you know, in my mind, John, it's the, it's the application of uh, industrial standard to our procedures. That's what I've, I've been to. I didn't go this year, but I've been to several. Secondly, I, I played nine holes yesterday, and I was so pleased with the clearing out of a lot of stuff. Uh, one time I did a 10-year analysis of every year, and uh, largely it was similar about certain places had to be clear with trees, you had to do this, you had to, it's all done. A lot of it's done, not all done. Not all. But I, I do think that the benefit is you get a guy who's been around, all these golf, 
when I was there, he talked about a course up in central Massachusetts, yeah. and over here, then a private course, and then a problem, and that's stuff you wouldn't otherwise get. It's cheap money, in my mind, for yeah. bringing in. And secondly, you say to people, look, we bring in the people to take a look, and uh, frankly, uh, no one is, everyone says, wow, that's great. Yeah. Everything that I've talked to. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, it's a checks and balances, yeah. like in anything else. I mean, to be honest with you, the last superintendent, God rest his soul, wasn't doing the things he was supposed to be doing. If you had USGA in here checking on what he was doing, you would have heard, right, the committee at that point probably would have heard, you probably should get away from this, you should probably be doing this, and it probably wouldn't have caused us to get to where we were and then have to make such a drastic change as when I came in. So, I mean, th that's again, if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, that's his chance to say, why are you doing this? You shouldn't be doing this, you should be doing this. That's, you, that's a red flag for you guys to say, yep. wait a minute, in a meeting, how come you choose to do this and you're not doing yeah. what the USDA said? And that's again, a check and balance for you guys. Well, I remember a story, it was a couple of years ago, and we were thinking about the 14th hole. You know, it's a par uh, five. five, five. But mm -hmm. goes, oh, my son's on it too. Sure. Yeah. And so I said, well, you know, maybe we should take the irrigation and bring it out and move the hole back and it was gonna cost a million bucks. Right. He said, no, 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 let's just move the tee back. That's why you move the tee, the tee back. Yeah, tee back I said, well, that's, you know, that's good stuff. But yeah. Because he has some uh, le legitimate background in those. So, and everyone said, yeah, that's a good idea. So you did it. Yeah. You did it. And, they, and they also have a lot of ancillary programs, not just turf specific, no. that you can take advantage of. Correct. I mean, you can hire, because they have uh, consultants within that group to do other things. They can. You know, they can look at any aspect of your operation Correct. and give we, you insight. We John, you were there. What did you, uh, what would you like to, anything additional? I, I just said my piece. Okay. Okay. I think it's good to have it. I mean, it's cheap yeah. money. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. You get another viewpoint in terms of uh, yeah. situations that are happening in the area. And I think that's the biggest benefit. And it, there's, and there's it's one It's management. It's practices. I mean, they might be doing some of that, this course that, you might want to try. <coughs> Correct. And, and to be honest with you, so. that's what, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I've said this over and over again. I've been with you guys for 21 years. There's other superintendents do it drastically different. This is the way that I've learned, right. and this is what I think works for me. Right. Now, the USGA comes in, he sees a lot of different practices in the manner in which they do things. And he can let me know, but why, let me, perfect example was how many times have we solitine our fairways and, and greens? That was one of the things he, we talked about when he first and said, what is, what's your plan? I said, this is what I plan on doing. He goes, do you think you can get to do it? I said, yeah, and we've done it. And that, he, that, that means a lot because now other people in the industry are, do, are copying what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, hands down. I know Captain's right. does exactly what we do. They, they go out in the middle of July and solitine their greens. Why? Because it works. Yeah. And once, once one does it, they pa we all pass it along. We're all in the same business. Yeah. Well, and I'm not trying to be better, than, I mean, yes, I'm trying to steal Captain's money as much as I can, but I want him to succeed as much as I succeed. You know what I mean? Same right. thing with any other golf course. We're all in the same pool. Are there plans to move, back to, to, to Tom's point, are there plans to move the blue tees on 14 up to the upper green mm, tee? And no. then move the whites back to where the blues are to make no. that course a, a true par five? Well, no, you don't understand is, you know, it, we talked about that a long time ago, and one of the things we talked to Mr. Mungum about, because we, you guys have a plan that was given to you by Mr. Mungum, one of the things he said was the initial intent of the architect at Cranberry Valley was to make that a short par five. But he takes it away from you on 16, 17, oh. and 18. Yeah. So <laughs> he makes it seem like he's gonna give you 14 and 15 and says, okay, well now here, here's a long par four that most likely you're gonna bogey. And then 17, I'm gonna give you a force carry that's over 200 yards. So then, so that understand what, you gotta look at the, the initial intent of the architect and what his plan was. Yes, and Cranberry Valley, if you look at the golf course in itself, is very much that way. He gives you the first hole, nice and easy, and then he sticks a par five straight down your throat. And then he gives you a hard par four right after that in number three. Okay. So understand the way that he, the architect set it up. That's what's so nice about Cranberry Valley, and I think people love it, is because it's challenging. It, it makes you think about how you're gonna play the game, and not only on every hole. There isn't one just like, and we call it, I call it like Ovanceville Fairgrounds, to me is like a Florida golf course. Bing, 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 side by side. They just go one hole, one hole after another. Yeah, there's a little bit of a suddenly here and there, but they're pretty much the same. Cranberry Valley is not that way, and it makes you think about how you're gonna play that golf course. Here's and we say this every year when we set it up for an MGA event. John will tell you. Everyone says, you know, all oh, the pins are in the middle, it's gonna be easy. Then they go out and play. And then they come back and it's one over, two over. 
you know, I've never well, heard that story before. I, I, I'd be very happy to help you write that. <laughs> so briefly, and, and we publish a little something, you know, the, the poet's analysis of, uh, I've never heard that, but, but it makes so much sense from a design perspective. Yeah. Correct. It's almost like the fourth you told was a sucker punch. It's a, it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You, we're yeah. gonna let you birdie, you know, who, you know who's really good. I was saying, why don't we make the 16th of, of I mean, what? Well, you know what makes me laugh is one of the, one of the, one of the guys that's like there now working for us right now is Jeff Converse. He does that yeah. Golf Monday. Yeah. And one of the, it's you, if you ever get a chance to, when you're up there, talk to Jeff Converse. He's the, one of the biggest historians of golf. And he will pass those little subtle things on oh, to you on the, that, on the Cape of just different golf courses and the way, wow. and the way, the way they. Wow. So. Uh, one last thing about the USGA uh, visit too, and, it, and it's kind of a collateral of effect, but I have heard from selectmen in particular because they appreciate that. Very positive remarks about the fact that we have, because it's, it's a little bit gutsy. You bring in experts and you look in the mirror and you say, how are we doing? Mm. And that, yeah. that takes a certain degree of courage <coughs> as opposed to not being afraid to be accountable. And, and it, that puts us out there. I can put you on this. There's no one else in the, te in the town of no. Howard that has that come in no. and does that on and a yearly or a, a bi-yearly basis. Well, you cannot point to another department in town that puts everything on the table every year and says, critique me in the manner in which you think that we, do, we could do something better. And, th and that, that speaks to the idea of bringing in expertise and relying on experts in the field. I think it's terrific. Well, you know, the last 14 years, I was a, a school district auditor for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I've been to 40 schools, probably 600 classrooms. We spent 10 days in a district. There's about six of us. And everyone is very closely selected for this, for that particular role. And, and the report comes out, and I can tell you that um, there is nervousness, and oftentimes it's valued what we do, and oftentimes we scare the life out of them because there's certain things they ought to be doing and they're not doing. Yeah. But in this one, the, the limited ones that I've been through, I've never really had him criticize as much as offer a, a, a encouragement or, or ideas about doing certain things. And then they go right into the ground and pick up the dirt and all the rest of that stuff. So it's a good thing, I think. Okay, under. Uh, yeah, whatever we're doing here is better than uh, Bayberry. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, that's well, true. exactly. Sure. An article exactly. Yeah, an article. Well, uh, yeah. and that's a, yeah. a you know, the, the point that John just made, uh, and not that I have an intimate knowledge of it, but it's, it's pretty well known around the Cape. Their problems are a result of not having experts help and assist, you know, with their plan of attack. And over the years, certain individuals, as I understand it, within town government of Yarmouth, decided they knew how to do it, quote unquote. And look what's happened. It's 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 too bad. Yeah. Too bad. Okay. You know, the the hard one is, and I'll tell you the honest truth is. You know, regardless of what went on here, we had a plan in the beginning, and when everyone, when everyone got on the same plan, we, we each held each other accountable, both the golf committee and both here, the superintendent and the director of golf. The issue you face in other towns is when you get a direction that's down a wrong path, it's hard to come back from that path, especially if the person that's making the decision thinks that they were on the right path. And that when that path ends up where it is with that, you end up in the wrong spot. Decisions were made long ago about especially Bayberry, yeah. that shouldn't have been done. I mean, I'll give you the perfect example is, when I first walked in the door, they wanted to build another golf course. Yeah. The first thing I said to them was, how can you build another one when you can't take care of the one you got? Right. And they looked at me and they said, he's right. <coughs> I said, you, you, to, you better bring this one back first before you can, my mother always said, you better eat the one you got before you think about getting another one. <laughs> and that's exactly where we were. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I think that we've done a great job in, min in maximizing our ability to maintain Cranberry Valley. Yeah. To think we, if we had another golf course at this point, how much we'd be at. And that's what some of these other golf courses are facing. The hardest thing that they face is filling that other nine holes, that other 18 holes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This, the market exactly. is I just agree. not there for it. So now you, you're <coughs> at a twofold. So. Well, especially now they're considering going to a leasing company as a potential. <laughs> That's the death march. Yes. Yeah. Right. The, the, you know, you have a better, and I said this before in meeting when we were talking about the, uh, one of the things they talked about on the nine holes was to make it into a solar farm. 
you have a better shot at making that into a solar farm than and then or make it into a junior golf course, the nine hole at Bayberry, yeah. than to give it to a management company. Because what you're gonna end up back was gonna be just like what you got, which is nothing. So you might as well make some money on it. Either junior program and you have junior members and they go play that and you make money on that, or you turn it into a solar farm and use it for something good. Because you're not gonna get the you can't get the golf with the government. I agree. Okay. That's right uh, Paul spoke about economic rent. <laughs> <laughs> Under continuing uh, old business, the capital project update, mm -hmm. and I'll just footnote this by saying uh, I found it interesting in the parking lot. Uh, John and Martha, obviously, and Tom, you're mm -hmm. tearing up with people. Boy, that's an awful lot of concrete they put into that foundation. And then, Tom, you'll love this. The other day. I heard a golf cart behind me, a gentleman that I know came up and said, I still can't understand why there's not a foundation under that building. And I said, I said, that was discussed at the, within the committee at, at length. I said, what, what would you say to an additional four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars cost? Oh, well, uh, <clears throat> I didn't know it would be that much. I said, well, I said, that's probably conservative. So the point is, I'm sure you have a lot of armchair experts coming up to you. Why isn't the building built? Why aren't we further along? And uh, actually, if you factor in the weather, not to make excuses for people, in the last week, I mean, these guys have ripped. Metal, the sides were Go going ahead. up today when I left. Yep. They That's were putting, they were starting to put sides up along the back side. Yeah. They'll go fast now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, the yeah. hardest part was the foundation. Yeah. yeah. It was, and <coughs> understand. That was the, the hardest. The hardest part is the foundation. When you have an engineer that puts that puts the amount of steel that he put in that building, in the concrete, that was that was the majority of the part. So we, that's why we part still need in terms of open open and complete communication. We need to continue to focus on communicating people. 120 days. It's on schedule. Okay, right. we're not tearing the parking lot up up in September. So don't get don't don't worry about that. Okay, because that's that's what I'm hearing. Okay, on a regular basis. Okay. Um, and how come it's taken so long to put the, the building up and so on and so forth? So people don't know no. what's going and, on. And there's so many intricate moving parts. For example, when I met with Roman uh, the other day, because he spent almost two hours with me, coincidentally, Bob Caffarelli showed up along with Paul uh, uh, Switzer. Switzer. He's a and uh, it, they had come up because the compaction test uh, on the, the backfill into the foundation had come in and, and the good news was uh, it was 99, 99%, yep. which the acceptable number, as Bob explained, was like 96% and you, get, and you get a pass, everything is okay. But I mean, those little things are important and we're fortunate. This Cardozi uh, is doing a very, very good job. Yep. It's, it's not just that it's getting done, but it's getting done correctly. Right. You I know, mean, I tell people it's, it's up to code. What are the delays? I said, well, there's been several. There's been some administrative yeah. delays. And we'll, we'll, be, we'll be okay in October. Yeah. Exactly. End of story. Well, yeah. you know, End of story. You know, the toughest thing people don't understand is, is even in your, in your own home when you do construction, things come up, things happen. Sure. Now, understand when you're in municipal life, there's more, usually there's a couple more things that are going to come up or a couple more red flags are going to, and they're going to make sure before they go forward that they're going to make sure that they, they dot all their I's and cross their T's. Because right. in municipal life, your butt's on the line. In your home life, you're only screaming at yourself. But in this world, if someone doesn't do something right, if that building falls down, people are going to pay for it. Sure. So we got to understand that we'd rather go slow and do it right the first time. Now understand, that top bound building that, we, that we're building is replacing a building that was built in the original 1973. So, and the odds are that this building's gonna go down anytime soon, yeah. it's gonna be there for another 40 years. So if you're gonna do it right, do it once. Exactly. And that's what always been my, exactly. that's always been my thinking. Yeah. My building's been there since the beginning. So if you're gonna put something up, especially in the town of Howitch, make sure you do it right the first time. Because you might be a long time before you see another one. <laughs> and I, went, I went down into the excavation as they were turning the corner, uh, you know, doing, doing the foundation. I'll tell you, when you get down below and see that perspective, uh, this, this was a lot more construction, I think, than people uh, understood. But it's I'm not exactly <laughs> putting a slab out there on a piece of flat land. No. I'm, I'm beginning to worry about you. 
I, what's your thinking? Pictures like this. He's in the bowels. I had no light. <laughs> I had no light. <laughs> I'll admit it. He's in the bowels of the Pepper Valley. In the bowels <laughs> of the <laughs> I, I like construction. And this was the uh, this was the floor that was poured. <coughs> and, uh, I, I talked specifically with the uh, clerk of the works, and he said that that went very well. And uh, if you understand concrete, he said there was only one little glitch. One of the batches that came in was setting up pretty quickly, but yep. they, they got around it. They got around it, yeah. and they, no problem. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you. With the amount of concrete that's in that, in that building and on that floor, like I, this ain't going anywhere. I mean, this thing is going to be yeah, like the a My critics, the critics I hear are the futurists. Well, yeah, yeah. so when are we going to get an electric sure. car? So much better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, only when we're sure that everything is in place to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's funny, I heard the same thing today. Yeah. You, you're sure? Yeah. yeah. Why do we do this, everybody? You know? And when you throw in the solar component, the solar. You know, that's why it makes sense. Uh, Sean, can you give us just a nail you down, but in terms of the rhythm of things, once the sides go up, uh, Mike yeah. told me that the roof will go on and then <coughs> take it from there. And then once basically the roof goes on, the siding's going on, they're going to put, they got insulation they're going to put inside the building because the whole building's going to be insulated, so they'll put all the insulation in. And then pretty much at that point, we've been doing drainage out front on both sides. We have yeah. drainage work going in on both sides. And then we'll start uh, getting ready to do some landscaping ourselves. Sure, uh, what's, what are those half rounds that are down that temporary parking lot? They've been there for a long time. Half. Those well, are the that's roof. The roof. Ah. That's the roof. That's the roof. That's the roof. They lock in. They they lock into each oh, yeah. other. Oh, is that how? Is that it? Yeah, they lock into each other. That's okay. the roof. Okay. The metal. The metal that you see yeah. down at the end. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the end. that's all the roof. Okay. And the way those are integrated, John. That, they lock in. That gives you a, a super strong support. Okay. So that the hurricane shear factors yep. can accommodate those solar panels. Okay. Uh, and. And also, Sean, uh, when you talked about landscaping, yep. so the windows, the window treatments, you know, the aesthetics that yep. we talked about as a committee, yep. those are going to take place. Yeah, these guys will put, the, this all goes in through them. These guys will put all that in. Right now, you see, like, you can't see it, but on the left, you'll see two beams that go across. Well, you know there's two spots for the doors to go in yep. there. They'll cut yep. those, to cut those when they put the, the uh, get ready to put the doors in. So all that will go and everything will, it will be right where the design is. It might be good to, to invite the uh, Harwich Garden Club to kind of help with the flower, the design. Well, I, I can't, I, we already have a plan. We have a plan. We have a landscape plan that's already been approved by the, oh yeah. And yeah. they were, they were uh, the planning committee. I just thought a yeah. couple, you know, an outreach. Yeah, no, the planning, the planning board made sure that we got a full landscape plan that I have to follow to a T. Okay. <laughs> I happen to be there for that meeting tomorrow. So it was the one guy. I just don't, I, it's hard for me to understand <coughs> when you have someone on the planning board trying to tell me what plants that I should put and where I should put it. And when I, when I asked them, I said, I understand what you're telling me. But in, in, real, in the real scope of stuff, what you should be telling me is as long as the plants go in in the manner in which they're supposed to be, should be fine. I don't think that w this type of tree or that type of tree would really matter to anyone on the golf course when they were playing on the golf course. The tree that's down the end of the parking lot ain't going to matter all that much. <laughs> But, they, but again, but that's the, that's the specificity they got into. I yes, they did. It. But no, I came down the driveway today to Oak Street and I took a left, and there was a guy in there with some plans. He was up about a, a, a 150 yards in the woods with a plan. I don't know who that would be. Uh, we're going to do the gas line up. Is that no. part of? Uh, it's is, is that ever ever source? Ever source. Ever source. Ever source. So is oh, that's for gas or is it No, it's for power to go to this building. Okay. We're in a, in go, we're, I'm going to leave it at this. I thought, I, it was a, I thought it was a hermit that was checking yeah. the place out. I'm going to leave it at this. We're in negotiations with Ever source right okay. now. Apparently they, you know, they want to, they got, let me put this way, no matter what, Ever source is a monopoly on Cape Cod. Yeah. They pretty much can try to tell us certain things. And I had a conversation with them and they don't like the answer that I gave them. So. <laughs> They, we're going back and forth, and we had a conversation with Chris today, and we have a big meeting next week in which sure. we're going to share some information with Chris and let him go up. And I, for me, I, this is the issue. It's not my money, but I get really pissed off when someone tells me that I have to do something at my cost when it isn't my line. We don't own the line. It's a, we were given that line. We gave that as an easement to the company. Right. Because they chose not to upgrade right. their equipment they're trying now to get us to upgrade their equipment right. for them. Yeah. And I will and I as as and I went over this already in 01 
when we had the same issue with the clubhouse, and I, ha I fought them then, and I said to Chris today, just today, listen, I'm gonna give you some information, some plans, and I think that at this point, I'm gonna put it in your hands, because you, as a chairman, I mean the town administrator, have a lot more power than me, just a lonely superintendent. So you go do with what you need to do with it. But I just, it, to me, the hard one is, no matter how you play, they, they, it, when you have they, a monopoly, they try, they, to, gotcha. they try to dictate to you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And, and I wasn't done, and I told Roman, I apologized to him, I said, as soon as the person showed up and he said what he did, I was, it just, it took me to that level and I, and I, I said some stuff I probably shouldn't have said and, and, I, and, and the manner in which it was not the, the best etiquette. And when I, I didn't swear, I didn't do any of that, but I just don't like being told that I have to upgrade their equipment right. at my yeah. cost. And, exactly. I and I tried to be as political as possible with right. by saying, <laughs> I don't think that's right. But it's like, it's like dealing with Especially when you're Comcast. a customer like the town of Howard. I mean, it's and not well, like we're exactly. you know, a little lying. Well, that's what I said to Chris today was exactly that. Like, hey, we, you know, we spend probably a quarter of a million dollars in electricity with this company every year. And here they are telling us that we have to upgrade our equi their equipment for them to <laughs> better serve our own selves. I said, if they had walked in, and I said to Roman, I said, you know, if they had come in and said, hey, listen, we know the equipment's old. It's been there since 1973, but we're willing to meet you halfway. And how about we, we split the cost? Yeah. If it's 150, we'll split it in between somewhere. <laughs> but they didn't even do that. They came in as, as the mob yeah. and so said, oh, yeah. by the way, hold on, hey, this one. By the way, you need to add this, this, and this. Oh, and by the way, you have to use our licensed contractor, and these are the specs we're gonna make sure you put in. I went, whoa, 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 excuse me, hold up. I said, this isn't my line, <laughs> this is your line. Yeah. You bought the line from Commonwealth of Mass, so why do I have to upgrade your stuff? And he looked at me like, well, you don't like it too bad. I said, well, I think we're at a point now where we need to have a conversation, which is above my pay grade, yeah, right. with some other people. Because I can't, we're gonna, me and you are going to bang. I told him, I said, me and you are just going to bang heads. That's the right so. thing to do. <coughs> and, and you know, like I said to everyone, it's only in the best interest of the, of the town that the, whatever electrical lines do come on are at the full capacity and 100% and safe. But how we get there is basically is above my pay grade. It, it relies with the town administrator and the selectmen and how they choose to do things. I used to live in Southie. If you have a problem, I, I could call <laughs> <laughs> So the capital project's on schedule. Like yes, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Good. We sh I mean, if everything goes the way it should be, we should be, by the, uh, by the time we get to the end of fall, we should be pretty much hopefully wrapping up a lot of the, the, uh, the small projects that we have left to do. Good. The only thing, and I want to be on the record. Yes. Mm -hmm. The only thing I want to be on the car. record for, it comes when we seats. started this project, we're not getting the clip. I want to be on the corner of that demolition of that old car plant. <laughs> I, uh, I want to be driving that dozer, Tom. I think it's going to get down kind of easy. Yeah, <coughs> yeah I don't think. I it think may uh, fall listen, down before we. We might just let you stand there with the hand yeah, on it as it goes over, because I don't think we'll have to push yeah. too much. I'm going to put parking in there. We're going to yeah. put parking in there. Yeah. Yeah. Handicapped or. Yeah, well, well I think what's. Uh, Tom, we have that. We have uh, the this you have plan. A, yeah, you have plan a whole Loman, it's, yeah. it's really yeah. well done. All right. Yeah. I'll get you an, I can either get electronic. No, no, just, yeah, just a question. Yeah, no, that's all going to change. No. The ha uh, yeah. handicap, um, the p building comes down, the gasoline tank gets moved, no. everything gets done. There's a wall that goes in there, a walkway yeah. that goes up. And the gas line's coming in too, right? Gas line? Uh, oh, well, uh, <laughs> get, that'll be that's wishful thinking on that one. I, well, let me put it this way. There's still, no matter what, there's still a moratorium on gas lines, so. Well, we didn't say connected, we said put down. Well, they're not going to. Key distinction. Yeah, well, we Underneath that parking lot, so we did not tear the parking lot up a month after we finished it. Well, I guarantee you, it won't be that gas line won't be coming up the parking lot anyways. It would be no, going down the roadway. At some point, it's going to have to go to the parking lot, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. But across the surf, we'll then what are you going to do? Go around the cart barn? It would come up the road. It would come up the set yeah. up the. It, you understand? You have limitations on where you can. Uh, you have water and gas on one side of the street. You have electricity on the other. If you go down the town of Howard or any road, you look at it: water and gas on one side. And on the other side is electricity. That's how they do it in That's the That's how they're organized. So th that way you don't have any problems. So if you water and gas are on one side of the street, electricity is on the left. I'm so right now. I'm comfortable as long as we don't tear up asphalt after it's been laid. I've seen it. Absolutely. Times. Oh, I, 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 I don't care where you put it. <laughs> as long as it's I'm assuming that it's going to come up the right side of the road where the water comes in. Okay. All the way up to the cliff. Okay. The good news is. 
There's no public comment since there's no, no public, public present. So I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.